We share our road test results from the new Audi Q3, talk about Ford's just announced driver assistance system, and answer your questions, including whether it's a good idea to cover your car in rhinestones. Next on Talking Cars. Welcome back. I'm Keith Barry. I'm Emily Thomas. And I'm Mike Quincy. And uh, we're here to talk cars. And the first uh, piece of information that we've got this week is uh, a new semi-autonomous driving system, an automated driving system. And it's from Ford. Uh, it's called Ford Active Drive Assist. It's part of uh, the Copilot 360 package, which includes a lot of uh, safety and driver assistance technologies. And this is, this is aimed right at the heart of Tesla's autopilot, right, Mike? Uh, yeah, but but the but you know you kind of hit on the key words here. I mean, it is a driver assist and not autopilot, and we've uh, you know kind of criticized Tesla for even using those words and implying that it's a self-driving car. And Ford is pretty clear in its press material that says this is not a self-driving car. I mean, we're we're kind of interested in in getting uh, a chance to test this because it uses the eye tracking to ensure the driver's alert as opposed to what Tesla does. Tesla just wants to make sure that the, the driver's hands are somewhere on the wheel. But we mm. weren't as impressed with that as we were as, were as like a Cadillac Super Cruise. So this system essentially, it will kind of take the wheel a little bit, it will keep a distance, um, and it's and it's going to be coming when? It's coming in the Mustang Mach-E, right? Yeah, the, the 2021 model year, I believe it was. And, you know, in, in Ford's own words, they said, you know, it's hands-free driving uh, to help with the stress of long highway drives. I don't know about you, but a long highway drive, my hands are the least of my worries. It's more like I'm getting tired or something like that. I, I, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little concerned that there's all this emphasis on hands-free because Consumer Reports has been a big advocate of saying, you know, drivers need to stay alert. They need to stay engaged. They, you know, they, they need to have their hands on the wheel. But this is this is a system like some that we've we've tested before, like Super Cruise, like Autopilot, like Volvo has one, Nissan has one. This is sort of Ford throwing their hat in the ring. Emily, uh, we're sort of heartened by the fact that this one seems, this system seems like some of the better systems we've tested, right? Yeah, it sounds like they're incorporating a lot of similar aspects as the Cadillac Super Cruise, which we rated highest when we went through the partially automated systems. Um, and, you know, in part because it does have eye tracking, it is using, you know, these driver monitoring systems, like Quincy mentioned, but more than just like, you know, is there touch on the wheel? It's going to be tracking head position. It's going to be looking for where your eyes are looking on the road. Um, so that combination definitely is uh, indicative of more driver engagement than mm. just keeping your hands on the wheel or having some sort of like touch on the wheel. Um, so we're definitely heartened by that. And just even the fact that it's limited in scope, you know, similar to the Super Cruise, right? It only works on like highways and roads that have been mapped by the system but there's no doubt about it this is i mean the fact that it's debuting on this electric car i mean one of the reasons why is because it, it has uh, evs have uh enough power to power one of these systems they take uh these take a lot of energy to run and a traditional 12 volt automotive battery and electrical system might not be enough to power all of the the cameras and sensors we don't know too much about how the system actually works but it's probably going to take a lot of processing power um but it also means that it's it's hit it's hitting right at the heart of of Tesla. So, I mean, the Cadillac Super Cruise, GM says that they're going to have 22 vehicles with Super Cruise by 2023, but right now it's only on the CT6, which is a yeah. big, expensive sedan that doesn't really sell in huge numbers. I've seen, I mean, I, I, I've seen like what, like three or four on the road. We have one. And, uh, <laughs> and most of the one time, of the three most or four, weeks, or? Yeah, when I'm when I'm driving by a reflective surface, I see another one. Uh, <laughs> plate glass windows. Look, there's a, oh, it's just me. But and it's a great car, but it just isn't. It's not necessarily that the same sort of savvy consumer who might be buying the electric Mustang. It's interesting that you said you know the the, the CT6 sells in in small numbers. So does the entire electric vehicle market selling in yeah, small numbers. Yeah. So I you know. Yeah. 
But this is a mainstream, this is a mainstream brand coming out with a system that is going to be sort of trialed on this one car. And I think it's really, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm really looking forward to when we get to test it, when we get in that mach -E, and we're going to get one as soon as we possibly can. And as soon as we can possibly get one with this Ford Active Drive Assist system. And, and as soon as we get it, it'll be up there in our ratings. So something to look, something to look forward to on long highway drives. <laughs> <laughs> so we also have just finished our testing of the Audi Q3, um, a new sort of subcompact luxury SUV. Uh, it's new for, for this year with a turbocharged 228 horsepower, two liter four cylinder engine paired with an eight speed automatic transmission. So that's up 28 horsepower and two more gears than the prior version. Gets 23 miles a gallon and it doesn't take premium anymore. It takes regular. And this is the most interesting thing to me. The base price range, it starts at under 35. It starts at $34,700, which is about what the average cost of, a, of any new vehicle is, let alone one from a luxury brand. So Emily, uh, I understand this has been sort of your your sort of quarantine pandemic car this is the car that you've been driving throughout all of all of this you've had it for a while yeah i've had it for a few weeks now i i get them in large chunks <laughs> um <laughs> but i really like the q3 um i had driven like the old version when i first started working here and i loved it immediately um that was also kind of like my first introduction to audi because my family is was notorious for having mostly you know like Japanese cars and I drove a beat up Corolla through grad school. So I was like, Ooh, shiny new and German engineering. <laughs> Look, <laughs> so <laughs> that might've skewed my opinion in the beginning, but I did really enjoy that car a lot. And so I was pretty pumped when we got a new one. Um, so I like the redesign, you know, it comes with some um, nice new features. I like how the infotainment system is not those weird like knobs anymore that were kind of annoying and they were just more tedious to get through anything like to be able to sync up your phone or do anything was just like a really cumbersome task i would have to sit in the cr parking lot for a really long time trying to set anything up <laughs> before i could actually leave work so i do enjoy that part of it that it's like touch screen now it's a little easier um i spend a lot of time in the back seat everybody knows this um setting up the child seats um sitting back there with my toddler and I found it to be pretty spacious, pretty roomy. The seats are comfortable. Um, even just the cargo area has been really great for us. Like we've been able to fit Micah's uh, toddler bike back there when we've gone for walks and stuff. I was able to fit my husband's brand new tool chest back there by like putting the seats down. And it has four aft adjustment now, which is really great. So like I was able to like push the second row like as forward as possible and fold down half the seats because each of them fold individually, which gives you like a lot of um, versatility, I feel like. You're able to kind of configure the back seat the way you need to, depending on like what you're carrying, which has been super helpful for like just, you know, different random stuff we've been doing. So I, I enjoy the car a lot. I think it drives great and I, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff I agree with there. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Uh, so the Q3 is definitely improved in a lot of ways. Uh, like Emily mentioned, the the the, the new touchscreen uh, infotainment system has gotten better, uh, better driving position according to you know all of our testers. And just it's a reminder: it's not just the three of us driving this car. We have a whole bunch of people that weigh in on this. Um, uh, forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection is standard. So that's yeah. also good news. Um, I thought it was it was too bad that uh, adaptive cruise control, which I actually I love, I use all the time. It's not standard on the base price model that you mentioned before, Keith, you know, about 35 grand. And that's, that's a little disappointing to me because every Toyota Corolla, ha you know, every Toyota has this. Every, every lower-priced uh, Toyota model has this standard. Um, and, and I also think it's, I also don't quite get the small, like, luxury SUV market. I know it, sell it sells pretty well, but I, th I just think it's kind of weird. I mean, to spend this much money, and ours was about, you know, about 43 thousand dollars i mean that's not that's not inexpensive in my opinion so would um, you get an a3 or a q5 instead well well no i just i don't <laughs> I, for, for that much money for a kind of a family vehicle emily i get everything you're saying my, my kids are older but when my kids were smaller when we would go to sign out cars for the weekend we would definitely think you know okay well who, what can hold the stroller and the child seats and all the babe the diaper bags and all that stuff but so for me <clears throat> for this much money i'm looking 
at a, a Kia Telluride, a Ford Edge. These, these, both these vehicles have a lot more room inside. Um, and, and, and so something like the, the Q3, the, the Lexus NX, the BMW X2, the Mercedes GLA, which, which Consumer Reports has tested all of them. Again, they're small, they're kind of expensive, and I don't think you get a lot for them. But I, I don't know, just, just, you know, just my take. So I drove this car. I, so I, I sometimes I like to try on different lifestyles with, the, with <laughs> when I get a different car. So you know we had this this Ram Laramie, and I just kept it uh, kept the radio on a Willie Nelson station on XM the whole time. And that, was that, just, that was uh, Mike Monticello right there. I'll tell you. Yeah, I just you know was driving around rural central Connecticut, just so living a totally different us, lifestyle. And then you mimic our lifestyle. Is that how it goes? Yeah, like I got mulch. I have a condo, but I picked up mulch. no, I didn't pick up mulch. But uh, so but like, uh, I can lend you Micah in the car seat if you want to try this. Out. This is maybe not that. Lifestyle. Talking I, lifestyles, so, <laughs> not talking cars. <laughs> no, so this Q3, I, I the week that I had it, I just happened to have a scheduled trip to New York, and I was staying in uh, sort of a really up-and-coming part of Long Island City and, you know, seeing friends in Brooklyn and staying in a, in a neighborhood I could never afford to live in, but that had a little bit of street parking uh, and had to pick up a friend at JFK, and and I kind of got the sense of what it would be like to, you know, have, a, have that sort of... Uh, wealthy young professional lifestyle in the city with a with a real nice condo and, and enough money left over to buy a, a small luxury car, and I, I really liked it. Uh, <laughs> I would say, you know, we went to you know there you know there there are three of us in the car. We went to an antique shop in Greenpoint. We found street parking. There was space for stuff. Went out to dinner. You know, found a space that we could just kind of squeeze this thing right into. I felt like I was in a commercial. I was going to say one of these you're, cars. You're, you're an advertising agency's dream right now. Yeah, next thing you know, we're going to open up a farm-to-table restaurant. Uh, just, you know. <laughs> but anyhow... <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, but I think in these sort of neighborhoods that, you know, uh, you know, in Boston, it's sort of JP or like the seaport, sort of these areas that are nice with with a little more, a little more parking places like Austin places, uh, you know, Silver Lake, uh, you know, West Hollywood, these, these sort of neighborhoods where, where it's, it's an, it's an urban area. So you don't have a ton of space to park. You have to have some money to live there and you want to be able to get out of the city. This is perfect for that. And I, I honestly, if, if that's your lifestyle uh you know if you want to trade just give me a give me a call but uh <laughs> i i think that your point about easier parking is, is a really good one and that's definitely uh, uh that definitely has an advantage over the vehicles that i was recommending for the same price but that's that's a really good hmm. point but on a you know on you know on the bqe on you know on a four-hour drive back to you know back home it, it you know stuck in traffic it was uh, on the merit it was just as comfortable as it was uh you know and as it was practical so i love this car basically or at least you know lifestyle that that i can't afford <laughs> version of me loves this car <laughs> so it's kind of nice we get to we get to try on all kinds of things it's better than getting to try on different washing machines or you know <laughs> different vacuum cleaners but talking lifestyles you make a great point about the parking though because i took it with me when i went down to philly for my grad school graduation and it's all street parking down by the university and so i was able to park great because it it is tiny enough that you know, you can get in and I was able to, you know, throw all my junk in and stuff. So everything you said is totally on point for that city kind of lifestyle of you having to park on the road. Just to clarify, this was all sort of pre-pandemic that, that, that we did all the fun driving in this car. Now it's just sort oh, of yeah, it's no. getting out of the house. Pre-pandemic. Great to hang your mask from the, you know. <laughs> Pre-child <laughs> lifestyle. All, all, all we do is drive, drive from our, our, our garages to our mailbox and pick up the mail and drive back. I'm just yeah. Oh, it starts. The battery's still. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> talking mailboxes. All right. To learn more about the Q3, uh, to see our full road test review, our scores, everything else, head over to consumerreports.org. It's all there. And if you're a member, uh, you can you can read all there is to say and a bunch of opinions uh, from people other than the three of us. Uh, so speaking of people who aren't the three of us, uh, it's on to some video questions. We love video questions. Uh, send them to talkingcars at iCloud.com. Uh, this first one, I, now, I, I don't think this is so much of a question. I think it's some, some advice. I think it might be someone auditioning to, you know, to get on the show. So let's take a look. Hey, Talking Cars. This is Chris Nelson from Redding, California. And I wanted to give you a quick tip on how to clean out the car 
as an alternative to using a suction vacuum machine. You can actually use a blower and it works really, really well. So anyways, give it a try. Just open all four of your doors and blast it out. All right. Interesting idea. And this is something, have either of you ever thought of this? No. Have either of you ever done this? No. no. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> just the thought, like just watching him describe it was giving me anxiety because I was like, my allergies would be so angry at all the dust just like flying around. And I feel like, I mean, for me personally, I would feel like the car didn't, like I like to suction dust up. Like I don't want to blow it somewhere else. Get that HEPA filter, <laughs> yeah, Claritin, exactly. microfiber like, cloth, yeah. I do like heavy <laughs> duty dust removal. So I think for me, I... I can see maybe if you wanted to like get rid of some larger debris, like, you know, if maybe if you had kids who do sports and they tracked in a bunch of like grass and leaves or whatever, but for kind of like your, I would, I would still follow it up with like an actual vacuum that, you know, sucks up dirt and gravel and sand, things that, you know, linger. <laughs> so... <laughs> No, my my I, my Audi Q3 lifestyle anxieties came up as soon as I thought all those dust chips and stuff blowing through the car. And yeah, I'm thinking, ah. I mean, in that wealthy yeah. lifestyle of yours, you would really be sad if your interior got yeah, messed up. You, you'd, you'd be you'd be kicked out of the Audi club, no question. <laughs> So the good news is that CR does have uh, people who test leaf blowers, and I and I reached out to Eric Hagerman, who's in who's in charge of the home section at CR, um, and and he said you, uh, you know, we well, gave a bunch of advice. This guy's got a battery powered blower, but if you have a gas powered blower, you know, about 13, 14 people every year die from using. Um, a gas-powered small engines in enclosed spaces. So don't do this in your garage. And, and Eric says you should absolutely not use a gasoline power blower in any enclosure. They emit carbon monoxide, which is lethal at certain levels. Um, so don't do that. That's kind of the you know if it seems like a good you know good idea, park it outside. Um, and also he says that with a battery-powered blower, uh, any blower using it inside of a car might amplify that sound. Uh, and those things are loud. Yeah, they are. Um, there's, and there's also, um, you know, an issue that these are these are blowing things rather than picking it up, and they can drive the dust into crevices where it will stay forever. I'm surprised. I looked online, and a lot of people do this, and I found some people who claim that they're sort of car detailing experts, and they they do it. I thought the I thought the video was was funny, um, neat idea, but I personally would never do it. Uh, all right. Uh, next question, I think, is time. Um, Peter asks, should I buy my friend's 2018 Golf R ooh, when his two-year lease is over? If I do, should I do it through the dealership when my friend brings it back? Or would it be better for him to buy it out first than I buy it from him? Golf R. Now, the issue with a car like this is... You know, any car that's meant to be sort of a performance car, you know, the Focus RS and, SA, you know, Subaru STI, uh, you know, back in the day, the Evo, is that people would drive them hard. And if you buy one at a used car lot, you don't know what you're getting. So I think, you know, he has this very responsible friend who has a Golf R and, you know, that's awesome. I, I have a lease right now. It's, it's almost done. And every time I've brought this car in, I, I've been told by the dealership, listen, what we're going to do is if, if you want to buy this car in the end, don't buy out the car. We'll take it back and then we'll negotiate in the price and we'll sell it to you as a certified pre-owned used car from less than the buyout prices. So for those who don't know, with a lease, um, there is an opportunity to basically pay the difference um, that between the amount that you paid in lease payments and what the car is currently worth at the time that you uh, at the time that you trade it in, but the issue is is that amount, which is called you know the the payoff figure, was calculated before you leased the car. So it's an estimate. It's what the automaker thought that that car would be worth in this case at the end of two years. Sometimes it's really high. Sometimes it's really low. And like all things, it's negotiable. So in practical terms, what it means is what, um, uh, you know, if you just pay that, if your friend just pays this lease payoff amount and buys the car and sells it to you, you might be stuck with a number that's, that's, that's way too high. So what I would do is I would find a dealership that you trust, 
you bring the car back and you know you ask if you can negotiate you tell them I'm, I'm interested in buying this car and suggest to them do you want to take it back as a as a as a lease return and then sell it and then sell it to me as a cpo as a certified pre-owned and you might be able to even get some some additional warranty on top of it which is nice with a volkswagen because they don't tend to be at the top of our reliability ratings um that's what i would do uh quince what do you think well, I, I have a few questions. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the warranty thing because I was I, I looked it up. Uh, the Golf R from Volkswagen gets a six year, uh, 72,000 mile warranty that is transferable when that's the, the critical part of a, of a warranty. Um, so I, I guess it, it, this is a two year lease, if I'm re- remembering the question correctly. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's plenty of warranty left. But my question is, why this particular one? I mean, does this person have intimate knowledge that his friend you know, took care of the car really well? Uh, does it have a, a good service history? And for whatever price that he thinks he's going to get if he, if he buys this car, what else can you get for that money? Yeah, and this is such a specialty car. I mean, I, I looked, there are only like two or three of these used for sale within 100 miles of the track right now. So uh, it's a pretty populated area. So um, it... it <laughs> This is going to be a very special case, but I would say start talking to the dealership now um, about that payoff figure and, and negotiate it because I, I think they're they're going to be able to turn this car around when it comes traded in on the lease. Yeah, you know, so, so so if if your if your heart is set on the Golf R, then that's one thing. But if you have a certain amount of money that you want to spend on a cool car, uh, I would I would you know consider your options is what I always say. Yeah. All right. So I hope that helps. Our next question is also about fun cars, but uh, it's it's uh, from Kalitha from Sri Lanka, uh, who says, I'm 17 years old and I'm planning to buy my first car next year. I personally don't like to drive simple cars like most people because I'm a heck of a car enthusiast. Do you have any suggestions for a 17-year-old car addict's first car? My budget is 15K to 20K. Um, I don't plan to take someone with me often, so I'm fine with going for a two-seater. Now, this is, and I, I love this because we get to, we're not just, you know, searching cars for sale in the US. This is awesome. <laughs> But I do have to preface this by saying that some of these cars we, that we're going to talk about, we haven't, we haven't personally driven, nor have we driven. You know, there are different versions of these cars that get sold in different parts of the world. So they might not have the same features. Exactly. Yeah, I've never been in a, in a Mahindra. I've never, you know, which is a great, a great, a great sadness for, for me, honestly. So my first, so I went to, I really, I, I love this question. I went to um, a couple of different sites that are the equivalent of like a, you know, cars.com, Edmunds Auto Trader for uh, used car marketplaces for the Sri Lanka uh, market. And uh, the first car that I saw that I thought was, oh man, the Nissan March. That sold in the, a lot of the rest of the world, even in Canada, not in the US, is the Nissan Micra. And it's apparently, uh, you know, it's a, it's a small, not very overpowered, fun to drive car that is light and tossable. And there, in fact, there are even single make racing series where people just race Nissan Micras. But then I looked at what was actually for sale and I'm realizing, I'm thinking of this as, as, as you know, me in the U.S. thinking, oh, that's an exotic, you know, strange little car. But he says he wants something that not everyone else wants. Uh, so I searched a little further because it appears that, you know, there are a ton of micros for sale. But I found in your price range that there aren't a lot of on the road. Audi A4, classic sort of, you know, young person enthusiast car. You can get an 05 or an 06 in your price range. The next one is a Peugeot 308. And this is a car that... I, I, I don't, don't laugh. <laughs> I'm laughing because you're French car man. I'm waiting yeah. for the, I'm waiting for the Renault to come up on your no, list. No, apparently they're just as rare in Sri Lanka as they are, in, uh, almost as rare in Sri Lanka. You can at least buy them there. Uh, so you would kind of stand out. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but honestly, the 308, it's a small car. It's, you know, really balanced, good handling. I don't know what, I, I drove one with a three cylinder and it actually had a ton of power, uh, you know, gas three cylinder. Uh, and and I drove it a few years ago, so it would be the same generation that's for sale there. All right, so our last question is from Diego, who asks, Pretty soon I'll be inheriting my father's 2013 Prius V. As you know, there are much better looking cars on the market. So to solve this problem, I have decided to cover the exterior of this car in rhinestones. Is this legal in California? Will it affect my fuel economy? My father says the rhinestones will never survive a car wash. Is there a particular adhesive that you would recommend for this task? I will say I 
actually reached out to various governing bodies in California, and strangely, none of them got back to me with the, <laughs> <laughs> with the answer to this question. But there are art cars out there. There are lots of, you know. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, the two perspectives I have on it are, one is, like, the practicality of applying rhinestones. I imagine it would just be a really tedious and time-consuming task that it just seems a lot of effort for something that may not be very long lasting or <laughs> useful in the long run, perhaps. That's just me. But then from the safety perspective, I'm concerned about visibility for other vehicles. You know, like during the daytime, like I can see all of those little rhinestones just catching the sunlight and causing like a huge glare issue for other drivers at night i can see it catching other people's headlights and high beams and again just making yourself blinding which is really detrimental for you as a driver and then also for everybody else around you so i mean i i would think that safety wise it's not the best avenue to go um because it just it seems dangerous i know that's a little bit of like the party pooping but i think there are other ways perhaps to make your car interesting that don't also make you a magnet for a motor vehicle crash, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> hopefully. And, and, and Quince, the question, can you get, can okay, you get through this without a, a Glenn Campbell reference? I was just going to say, you know, this is the first time in Talking Cars history that we could talk about Glenn Campbell, who has a song called Rhinestone Cowboy. Um, yeah, from, from using a, a leaf blower to, to clean your car to cars from Sri Lanka to rhinestones. This has been a boom. Uh, the roller coaster where did this question come from? I mean, holy cow. I mean, listen. We um, love, I, honestly, this is, this is, these are some awesome this questions. This is a lot so of fun. Yeah. yeah. It makes this is, you know, Tell me what the fuel economy of that. No, these are cool questions. <laughs> um, but, but for the, for the Prius V, listen, this is a car that's super practical, very fuel efficient, incredible reliability history. Uh, it's inexpensive to own and to operate. So I, I know this is not your car of choice. Uh, and, and so Emily's talking like a mom. I'm talking like a dad right now. Drive it for a while. Save your money for, for something that you want. And, um, and maybe kind of skip the whole rhinestone thing because it might be like one of those, you know, those tattoos that you got when you were younger and then you got older and you thought, well, no I, thought it was a, I, I thought it was a good idea at the time. Um, no. <laughs> well, isn't it, isn't it like a pretty easy car to to resell like it i imagine it has good value right so mm -hmm. something oh, yeah. like that might really kind of diminish the value which would really stink when you have a car that can sell well <laughs> but 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 in talking about this question keith had the best idea yeah so diego i love i love what you're doing here i love it when people try to express themselves in a car i think it's i think it's awesome and but i just don't want you to back yourself into a corner where you can't sell this thing and get something that is really you and that doesn't say you know i i drive a car that my parents want me to drive uh, <laughs> so um i am practical you know a little bumper sticker um <laughs> So uh, it's sort of a, a tale of two cars in my neighborhood. There's, there's one person who has put uh, floppy disks, glued floppy disks all to the outs. <laughs> and the five and a quarter ones too, not the Where three and a half. Where do you find that many? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they glued them to the outside of their Honda Civic. And that thing is never going to sell. Uh, I mean, they're going to, they're stuck with this car forever. But someone else in my building, uh, they have a, um, they have a Prius and they have given it an iridescent car wrap. And a wrap is sort of like a vinyl coating that, that, that safely applies to the outside of a vehicle. And when you're done, you can peel it off, which means you can change it out as often as you want. And if you're done with the car, you peel it off and you know, no harm, no foul, and you can resell that car and get something else. So my neighbors, theirs is iridescent. It, it actually looks really cool. It looks kind of like one of those like hyper color shirts. I, I like the look of it. And if they don't like it, they can change it. Um, and it costs about $3,000 to get done. Uh, but you can try it yourself. And it sounds like you're looking for a project here if you're looking to glue uh, a ton of rhinestones to the outside of a car. So that's what I would say is I would say um, get a wrap. And speaking of 
wraps. I think it's a wrap for this episode because uh, we've been talking a lot today. So keep your questions coming. We love questions of all different kinds and the practical to, um, to the fanciful. It's awesome. Uh, however you appreciate cars, we appreciate it too. So send those to talkingcars at iCloud.com and we'll talk cars again with you soon. Thank you.